Ave Kriesel ist Data Scientist. Und der eine oder andere kennt ihn vielleicht noch vom 31C3, wo er den relativ bekannt gewordenen, berühmten Xerox Scanning Bug Vortrag gehalten hat. Dieser hat ihn offensichtlich nicht nur hier bekannt gemacht, sondern sogar auch zu internationaler Bekanntheit verholfen. Und damit begrüße ich ihn und freue mich auf einen spannenden Talk und bitte euch nochmal um einen ganz, ganz herzlichen Applaus für David. Dankeschön. Thank you. Ja, danke schön. Herzlich willkommen. Thank auch nochmal von mir. Auch an die Leute. My part as well and also to the people online. And the people from Spiegel, who I know are in the audience. It's great to be back. My name is David Kriesel. I'm an IT professional from Bonn and professionally I concern myself with data science and machine learning. Essentially, I try to extract knowledge from large amounts of data. And ever since 2014, I data retained roughly 100,000 articles from Spiegel Online. And I didn't tell anyone. And in those two and a half years, years when I didn't tell anyone, public opinion kind of pivoted. Because these days people are talking of fake news. And we now have a huge amount of data on the perhaps largest opinion maker of our nation. And there are two things that, are we, that we're going to use this data for tonight. We're going to look through the data and um, learn something about Spiegel Online and in such a way that you can take it home and um, use it for yourself. And secondly, we'll see how the data retention mania of our age works. And um, we're going to do this in a way that it's understandable for anyone, not just IT professionals. And I'm going to look at it from a social perspective as well and see how modern data processing can change our society. And whether or not this um, change makes our world better or worse, well, I'll leave that up to you at the end. So first, let's see how Spiegel Mining works. Around the clock, every couple of minutes, one of my servers looks at Spiegel Online automatically, and if there are any new articles available, then it, they're downloaded and stored. And this gives a huge advantage to my data set. I can... I, I get new articles mere minutes after they've been published, so I get them in their original state without any corrections that may be applied later. And this, of course, is much better than downloading articles that have been online for years and might have been edited hundreds of times. And I extract certain features from these. Features can be the date of publication or the category. And these features, I, I take these features and um, analyze them. And the most interesting of these analyses I take to write a blog article which um, gives people an insight into the world of Spiegel Online. And we're going to do some very simple analyses first to see how it works and um, firstly I want to see how often all categories occur. The size of the, of the circles shows you how many articles have been published in a certain category and of course it's dominated by politics the, and panorama, the uh, green circle and sports which is the the violet circle at the bottom. The, the, 
These three categories make up half of the articles. And of course, the next very simple feature is the date of publication, which lets us measure how many articles they write per day. And this looks very, very messy. It's almost impossible to see any patterns. This is due to weekends where, of course, fewer articles are published than normal. And here's the first article, the first practical article. I obviously had a, as you can see, I had a gap in my data in March. And this is because March in German has an E, so an umlaut. Luckily, I noticed this after only a few days, so if, if you gather data, then you should build a, a warning system that tells you if no data has, um, if, if you haven't received any, any data. Luckily, I had this, but um, I left it. I, I set the time out too long. So, uh, eventually, we can calculate. It, it's, it makes more sense to calculate the articles per week instead of the articles per day, and it shows you that they publish roughly 100 articles per day. So, the valleys that you can see here are the Christmas weeks where fewer articles are published, and the, the data set for this article is from the 4th of December, so you can't see that valley yet. And if you look at some features individually, um, you can look at them individually, but it's even more interesting if you look at several features together. And this shows us that, for instance, the, uh, the, the output in politics and panorama is constant, but science and um, academics has um, decreased quite a lot. And this is not just for these two. There are several other categories. And this data is very interesting if you're in competition to Spiegel Online. So half, half of what we have to do is just taking features and putting them to, together cleverly. This shows you the typical lengths of an article per category and an average article in culture is twice as long as, no, almost third times as long as an article in sports or panorama, and still twice as long as politics. But despite their short length, short average length, politics, sports and panorama are the most most popular resorts and the most popular categories. And this means that what they're optimizing for is reach. So the, the categories that are shortest are those with the highest output. And I'm saying this without any, without any, I'm not trying to value it. It's simply an observation. If those who, who hate aren't taken seriously, it's, uh, it's just an observation. And most of the things that I'm going to be speaking about in my talk, they're probably the same for other media. Another important thing is experimenting with features. This um, shows the volume of publication per day and per hour. So the, the rows are the weekdays and the columns are the hours of the day. And of course, um, during work hours during the week, most articles are published. And now you can learn how things are done in data science. You always you always find views validated that you've always expected. That's a boring part of data science, but it's good to check your measurements. We can see, for instance, that few articles are published during the, the small hours of the day. But secondly, in data science, you always find patterns where you didn't expect them. And this is, this always happens when you combine features. So I'm going to show you articles by weekday and time and the length of the article. So the red articles are longer than the blue articles. So the long articles are 
always or most often published at five o'clock during the weekdays. And uh, the same is true for the weekends, um, though delayed a bit. And thirdly, data science's job is also kindling the worst kinds of prejudices. Give me a show of hands who of you thinks that the people from the culture section like to sleep in a bit. So we have, for the, for the internet, we have a room of thousands of people and almost everybody raised their hand. And the solution is, yes, they're right. The cultural scientists Publish, tend to publish their articles later. Later, so the the upper graph shows you the articles in every, all categories but culture, and the bottom one shows you just culture. But because they come in so late in the morning, they also go home early. But uh, to not just feed your prejudice, uh, I was invited to Spiegel on in October, and that's what I told them as well. And then, then they said, no, no, David. Uh, some of these articles, of course, are scheduled in advance. I have to say that. So just to keep you on tabs, if you work on these things, don't stop thinking on by yourselves. Uh, what you really can conclude from, from these findings if you went in with some prejudices like we did just now. So we've just seen how evaluations like this work. So now we can go one step further. And of course, in the internet, things get really crispy when personal data gets involved. So I thought, wouldn't it be nice, a nice feature, if we would read what the authors were from the Spiegel Online articles, and that's what we'll do now, and evaluate this in two ways. The first will be a very new evaluation, a new kind, and the second would be somewhat politically incorrect. Now, the first evaluation will try to uh, uncover personal sp sto staff structures in turn to speak Spiegel Online. Now, you do not just know who wrote an article, but who writes with whom and with articles. When authors often write together, then you can assume that they work together a lot. So you can understand which authors are important for which other authors. And those that do not write with together often are not important for this kind of view. So we can kind of build a map of authors this way. And that's here. This is what it is. And this is part of the social network of Spiegel Online authors generated in time. And every author is one of these bubbles. Authors that don't occur a lot have been filtered out. And you can see that there are groups, clusters of authors that cluster together. And that looks like these are the teams. Now we have to check whether this kind of uncovering from the outside is actually true. So we now color the authors according to their categories, which we can get from the Spiegel imprint. And in many cases, we see that the categories, the different departments have formed automatically. Now we have sport, health, network, politics a bit more distributed. I didn't circle them all. Panorama, travel. I'm not going to name all teams, but you see how it works. The, the red distributed buttons are the Bento team that work a bit overreaching. That's the Young Spiegel, if you don't know. And the thing is, we have quite exactly been able to map who is internally in the same team with whom. And now look at all those gray bubbles. These are gray because they cannot be categorized from the Spiegel imprint. Maybe they've left the, uh, for, for, for example, the, the head editor has suddenly turned gray recently. So next to these colored groups, we can still assign them to the same teams. We can say something about them, although we don't really know anything about them, and that's quite interesting. So we can live uh, find something out about these people, and now we go to the politi politi politically incorrect part. You can 
Now, I can now turn your attention to something. Every line here is an author, and from the left to the right you have time passing, and every, every stroke is an article published by this author at one time. And if we know one of these, these authors now, then we know who will publish when. So, we see this line with regular, a regular pattern. This is a columnist who publishes ev once every week, apart from certain weeks, and with other authors, the density is higher. So we know very well when these people are on holiday too. Be because these are the gaps in the slightly dense lines. So if we know the holidays, we know whose holidays with a high proportion overlap with someone else's. So things like Christmas, where almost everyone is on holiday, you can just uh, re reduce out. So now I'm appealing to your experience and now uh, assume that you have certain colleagues that always go on holiday together, right? So joke aside, with such data, you can read who is linked with whom in a romantic way. And this is why I've anonymized the authors, because it's very clear, well, of course, these are not all couples, but these are candidates for couples. And if, you, if you're interested in such a thing, uh, you are in a 99% stretch of the, the way, and uh, you've all been laughing now. Can I just ask for a show of hands, who of you has taken holidays to be here from their employers. So, for about all of you, these data exist. Believe me. And so, let's just stop for a moment and ask ourselves what we've just seen and what the social implications are. What we've just seen is gaining knowledge about internal information in very personal areas of life from data that doesn't really look like it would be about this at all. It's just Spiegel articles. And now we've got some clear evidence who's romantically linked to whom and we have some structures. And this gets me to the most important message of my talk. If you publish data, it's not you who decides what you're publishing, it's your adversaries. And we haven't even looked at the data themselves. We haven't looked at the contents of the articles, just metadata, times and authors, just as with data retention. That's, that's all just metadata as well. So just take a few months of your metadata, whom you've sent mails and WhatsApp messages to, what, what websites you've visited, just that. I can then tell you what your best friends are, if you have an affair, what your sexual orientation is, whether you're pregnant, whether you're sick, what your political orientation is, your, your, what your religious beliefs are, whether you have financial problems and everything I've just forgotten. So the abuse potential for this kind of data and of data retention cannot be put into words. I'm not going to start with conspiracy theories and all that. We can all believe that data retention is there to clarify crimes and is useful for that. And that's quite a plausible thing to think. And you can also believe that the people that are storing and, and, and interpreting these data are all goodwill. We can all assume that, but that does not mean that someone will come into power next month who has has very different intentions. So what we build, what we're building here, is the infrastructure for a general surveillance that even George Orwell's Big Brother would be ashamed about. And that kind of surveillance. This surveillance infrastructure we are now expressly putting aside for the case that a new government is malignant and wants to use it. That's what's happening, what's happening right now. So we've now had a brief detour to metadata, now back to Spiegel Online to raise the mood a bit. And uh, a small insert now that you can use the next time you reach Spiegel Online. So let's go for something slightly bigger. When I was reading reading the author's names from those articles, then at some point I was quite annoyed. Because sometimes they're on top of the articles, as you see on the left or at the bottom, as you can see on the right. And if the authors are on top, they, the names are written out, and at the bottom you have short names. So you have a full sentence at the top from Marcel Rosenbach, and at the bottom you've just ha you just have a nickname, sometimes just the last name or four or five words. 
the friendly Mr. Philip Alvarez de Souza Suarez. I've written it down explicitly, five words just for one name. So data science can be annoying from a technical point of view. Don't say I haven't warned you. So I just said, what the fuck? Why are there authors in so many different ways and different places? So I took that as a feature, asking whether authors would be mentioned on, on the top or the bottom. And I took some measurements from these groups of articles and compared them, the authors on top articles and the authors at the bottom articles. And the authors at the bottom articles, without full names, are typically articles roughly 300 words long or less. You can see the length of the articles without uh, full names. And towards the right, articles will be longer. But if the authors are on top, an article typically is more than two and a half times as long, about 750 words. So you know what you want to be Googled with as an author, right? And another thing, the long articles uh, have a 2% uh, probability of a news agency being involved. And uh, with the short articles, the percentage is uh, higher. So if you want to know who wrote the articles themselves, look at where the names are. If you have a short, if you want short, short agency, agency news items, names at the bottom. So we've already seen that uh, at the beginnings of the day, that is the time where most long articles are published, and these are in fact the ones that are written by the authors themselves. That percentage is, is comparatively high in the morning. So we can now take a step back and ask what's been done, and we have this huge amount of articles, and we've just cut them apart in very simple ways. We've divided them into weekdays, times of the day, categories, and well, with these simple ideas, we've had some very interesting results already. But what we haven't done at all yet is look at the contents. And wouldn't it be totally cool to just divide the articles into the actual topics which they are about? Spiegel Online delivers a good help for us here because they have keywords. Every article is given about 10 keywords from their authors. The article on the left has the keywords politics, abroad, Saudi Arabia, King Salman of Saudi Arabia. So I took those keywords from all the articles. I have about 65,000 keywords, which I found. And now let's look how often keywords appear in the same articles, different keywords. So the keywords that almost always appear together, they are in a way, they are married to each other, which you can regard as one and the same. And on the other hand, there are keywords that have their own existence and are never or almost never in the same article, so they're not related. And then there is a certain middle way, uh, an example here, politics and Angela Merkel. Angela Merkel. Um, so, an Angela Merkel article uh, quite often has the politics keyword, but uh, the other way uh, is not quite the same. There are many more articles on politics without Angela Merkel as a keyword. So, these keywords are not the same, but clearly they are linked. So, we are measuring for all 65,000 keywords pairwise how related they are, and then we link those that are strongly related with very strong springs in a physical sense, which pull those keywords together. Less related keywords get weaker springs, and we now run a physics simulation and see how these thousands of thousands of springs will adjust each other and themselves. And, and you can see that some keywords will be brought together and some not so strongly. So we have a topic map of all the things that Spiegel Online reported about in the last two and a half years. And it looks like nothing is happening, but this is where the detailed work is going on. You can't see it from such a distance. So let's zoom in very closely to really learn what we have created here. This is the Dieselgate affair. Volkswagen affair. Uh, you see the keywords have different sizes. The size of the keywords reflects the number of articles having the keyword. So these are the articles that are in those keywords. And the color shows what the primary category is for these articles. So this, this kind of yellow is economy. 
which fits. So the funny thing is that this kind of depiction is very strong. Uh, you can gain a lot more insights from this kind of image, not just, not just what's related. You can have all kinds of measurements that you will show with colors, of course. So you have these colored keyword landscapes now. You can see whether topics and measurements are related, and that's what we will do today. But let's look a bit further first. Uh, various airline accidents. This is between Panorama, Green, and Politics Red. And the political, political elements are from the Ukrainian uh, shooting down of an airplane. And my voice is failing now. That's better. Well, not mine as a translator, I should add. But. <laughs> okay, now this is the Greek crisis. Uh, now this clearly is between politics, uh, red and economy, yellow and Wolfgang Schäuble has been layouted in this very same place. He's in gray, not due to his age, but because his keyword has no dominant category. And now something more recent. Now this is the US presidential election 2016. We see Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump and everything that's gathering around. And of course, it's all red for politics. And you see the keyword emails being added to that. Right? And from there, we'll now look at just understand the whole size of the landscape. Did you see the micro, micro, microscopy, microscopy talk today uh, where people were zooming in? And we'll now zoom out and understand how huge this whole map is. And uh, we're zooming out now. We are just seeing the old frame. Uh, and you see how the US presidential election is embedded into the whole political landscape. You see the Syrian civil war, the Islamic State, Islamist terror, and on to France, just next to it. Yeah, the mathematics has no mercy here. At the top you have the recent Turkey topics, the recent coup attempt and the dictatorship. And to the right you have Russia and the Ukrainian conflict. And left below is Israel and the conflict. And now let's zoom out again. Now this is the whole political landscape. This time we have two rectangles marking where we started, the presidential election, then the foreign politics section, now that's in the upper right. And lower right, lower left you have the domestic politics. And recently you have this huge cluster in the middle, that's the refugee topic. A huge cluster that's developed just be between domestic and foreign politics, which fits of course. Now zoom out again. Now you can't see anything anymore, just differently colored landscapes, just some broad orientation. This is where we're coming from. The red thing is the politics part. Then in poisonous green, you have panorama uh, divided by economy. Uh, now this, this Turkey's cluster chain is net, network, uh, net world, and then you have the cultural and so on and so on. We can't go through them all, but you see these areas uh, have overlaps and, and are linked with each other. And you can see how large it is. Let's zoom out once again, one more step. And this is the whole thing. We've seen the lower part, and this is where we actually started. And the rest of the world, somewhat distant to the rest of the world, you have science. I see you can understand and you've been working in that field once and very far away from the main continent you have sports and now we see how large the whole thing is and how broad the Spiegel topics are and you can see that all on my website you can do your own research on it as in the Google Maps kind of thing which is much more fun than me doing it for you. So that's what we'll do now we are going to apply this. Spiegel Online under many articles offers well, 
Hmm. Well, the laughter starts before I'm even mentioning it. You're not, you're not even sure what I'm going to say. They offer you to state your own opinion. And under some articles, they block this opportunity. And that's what we look at now. And I did say that at the start that some articles uh, have, were retrieved just a few minutes after publication. So if I found an article could not be commented that uh, was right from the start uh, that so no one would comment that quickly and uh, so let's very, very briefly look uh, how things developed temporarily and temporarily and you see how the, the ratio of articles that can be commented are red is those that cannot be commented and in blue they can be and when I started out downloading it was about 80% of articles that could be commented and exactly since the big refugee topic came up and was reported on the commentable article articles are declining and now since a short time it's actually the majority of articles that cannot be commented the red line is overtaking the blue one and that's not just in the politics category it's across the whole offering and since the hate in the net has become so much worse across the internet or Spiegel online is too much afraid of these mean comments I can't read that from the numbers you'll have to decide that on by yourselves so the interesting thing is the small green plot there again these are non commentable articles but these have a small Ex excuse or apology at the bottom because of netiquette. Uh, I've we've blocked this. You don't have to read this through. Uh, so this apology used to appear on refugee articles at the beginning, and it seems like Spiegel Online itself wasn't quite happy with the rise of comment blockings. But as you see. This hint has been taken out a lot now, even though commenting has been blocked more and more. And now back to the land. The, the map. We, the more red a keyword is, the fewer articles in its category are commented, and the more blue it is, the more articles it can be commented on. And the gray keywords are roughly the average, where about 70% of articles can be commented on. And of course, this is not, this is a continuous scale. And I'm going to publish the map on my website as well, where you'll be able to click on it. We're going to start with some simple things. You guessed it, sports is almost always commentable. It's very blue. And if you wonder about the red dot in there, that's a specific article format, which technically cannot have any comments. <clears throat> and another topic that also usually allows you to comment is technology and um, economy. These are strikes, um, strikes by the German railway. And speaking of strikes, Probably most of you are thinking of Lufthansa, who, <laughs> whose main, whose main business seems to be strikes. They're very, very blue. Uh, you, you may laugh, but I arrived here by plane. After all these blue topics, let's look at something red. Deep red is around um, justice, which are reports on criminality, murders, attacks, and they prefer to have fewer people comment on these. The commentability on these is around 30%. This is the NSU topic of neo-Nazi activity. And this is um, the same for, for all neo-Nazi topics. And the reddest of these is 18% commentability. Also deep red is refugees and not just concrete articles but also asylum rights. So from the outside it looks like Spiegel blocks comments systematically depending on topics and it's very powerful that we can see this systematically. So it's not just, it's, it's important not simply to analyze, it's also important to visualize information, which allows people who are not IT professionals to find patterns. There's only one direct connection to the brain, that's your eyes. 
And things get really interesting when you look at how Spiegel Online orders commentability by nation. This is the Middle East conflict in Israel, and um, they allow virtually no comments on any of these articles. Let's move to the conflict in Ukraine, and suddenly... So, as a take-home message, ladies and gentlemen, it's fine to bash the Russians. And what we did here is simply visualizing and measuring our filter bubble. Iran's okay, you can comment on that. Great Britain, yep. Turkey, yeah, they're not quite sure about that yet. And France is interesting. This part of the map would like to be blue, but all the keywords around the terrorist attacks are deep red, and that extends to their neighbors as well. And let's look at that in more detail. All of these are articles on France, but by time. The blue line is um, the amount of articles that could be commented on, and red is what could not be commented on. And we can see that... 2014 and 2015 was mostly commentable, if you will. And then we had the series of terrorist attacks in November 2015. So obviously we get a large peaks, a peak in articles that were published on France, and most of these could not be commented upon. So you're allowed to comment on France, but not on the attacks. And the interesting thing is that this has persisted. Ever since the attacks, fewer articles could be commented upon, that, you know, fewer France-related articles could be commented upon. Let's take another step back, and I can see that Spiegel Online can simply, I, I can understand that Spiegel Online can just block artic, uh, comments based on their past experiences. And of course, that's, they have every right to do that, to decide whom they give a platform and whom they don't. But we also have the right to make this visible. And I think it looks like Spiegel Online prevents artic, comments on articles where they suspect that readers' opinions might not be opportune politically. And if this says, says something about Spiegel Online or about our society at large, I'll, I will leave up to you to decide. So my talk could be divided into two parts up to here. Firstly, we just divided our collection into just a few buckets and afterwards we divided them into way more buckets and each article could even appear in several buckets at once. And this was far more complex but also far more powerful. So remember these two ways of bucketing articles and now we're going to do something political. We're going to look at campaigns. Campaigns, political campaigns, work very similarly. They do voter targeting where they divide their voters into several categories. So, for instance, you could divide them by gender, skin color, age, and income. So you could all black women in California who are of a certain age, and you know, you could send them targeted advertising. And this is a very rough way of targeting. And it works an, uh, in analogy to, to the targeting we did on the left part of the previous slide. But what would be the right part of the slide? A few weeks ago, this article from the Swiss Tagesanzeiger went viral. I'm sure many of you have seen it. It was, I was, I was told to read it dozens of times every day, partly because, of course, I research on this topic. And it claimed that a data analysis company had succeeded in doing a very fine-grained analysis of potential voters, which would be the analogy to our map. 
and went on to say that they did it for the U.S. presidential election as well as the Brexit debate. debate. And it claimed that this is the reason that Trump was elected and that the Brexit went through. And of course, this is spooky and it sells well. Oh dear, the same company behind Trump and the Brexit, which is where your tinfoil hats start glowing. And they claim that their petitioning of the voters is so fine-grained that you can send perfectly targeted advertising to each voter. And they can go even further. They can target the tone of their of their advertising so that they hit very, very precisely. Of course, it's not clear what they actually, if, if they actually succeeded, because most of the information is comes from the company itself. And I think they sent a very good salesman to these uh, to the press, who you know gave a very good talk to the press, and they just bought it. All he really said is that you can, I can give you advertising that's very well targeted to your target audience. So in other words, finally, we can, we can only target, uh, we can target Viagra spam to only those people who actually need it. But we can't force them to vote or to buy, buy something. They still have to do that on their own. Big data can't do that. So if you if you're afraid of this, what you should really question is your own judgment. Yeah, yeah, um, bestimmt. And I'm sure some of you had the same train of thought, and I didn't expect any applause at this. And they felt relieved at this, but the problem is your own judgment. Very few people question their own judgment. In fact, most people vote for the person who shouts something that fits emotionally just a few days before the election. And of course, this is what politics want, wants. I mean, where would we get if politics rewarded long-term success? And this emotional targeting works with highly per personalized advertising in a very efficient way. And this means that data science technology can influence elections. I was speaking of um, data retention earlier. I'm on the CCC, so I think that most people shared my opinion in this. And this brings me neatly to my point. Do you know what, the, what this company used to track people? It was Facebook likes. It wasn't any state surveillance. So data that people voluntarily gave. And it makes sense to be critical of state surveillance. We have to do that, in fact. But if we are completely uncritical of ourselves and publish all this rubbish, any you know, indiscriminately to Facebook, then we haven't gained a single thing. My talk is nearing its end. There are two more things I would like to speak about, a little surprise. And I will conclude with a plea to you all. Firstly, the surprise. Did I say uh, I downloaded hundreds of thousands of articles from Spiegel Online? I meant more than 700,000. I download every article. I download all the articles, not simply, not just when they first appear, but um, in increasing intervals as well. So we can measure what's been changed, what has changed in an article. And to keep this short, I'm not going to give you a huge analysis, not just because of this talk, but also because I didn't have the time myself. But I have a little, I have a short demo. I track whether or not titles have been had been changed, and you find some interesting things here. There's not just the title, the, the headline itself. There's also the hate HTML title tag. It's it appears at the top of the browser window, and of course I track those as well. 
Also, ja, wobei der hiesigste Artikel ist am 20. Januar 2015. This article is from the 20th of January and on the 21st of January, so one day after it was published, der HTML-Titel hat sich geändert auf... I was notified that the title tag had changed to SAP, SAP grows more slowly in 2014 than planned. So I wondered what was it, what was the title before? When the article was first published, it was not SAP that was growing, it was the CEO of SAP that was apparently growing. And I like these little quirks. Because it shows that there are still humans working on the articles at Spiegelon and not just computers. And today it's called SAP is unable to reach their growth and gain targets. So this shows you how powerful the data set actually is. I have a history of each article and this gives me even more powerful uh, opportunities. And this was my, my surprise and here's my plea to you. You've seen all manner of things now. We've divided articles in simple and complex manners. We've seen that different ways of visualizing things are, have different power, and we have tracked lots and lots of features from all of these articles. Even more complicated features. For instance, you could track the links in each article and see if certain authors have their little friends to whom they like to link. There's no limits to your imagination. And of course, we could, as I just showed you, we can also track what has been changed in articles. For instance, we can see where there's the biggest uproar, where the comments were closed after a certain amount of time. So if you have any ideas, please send them to me. If you have any ideas how I could analyze this data set, and there's a message I would like to send to you if you work on data. Raw data is awesome. Or even sexy. <laughs> So keep all the raw data if, if you can at all afford it, by, um, if you can at all afford to stay it. I have more than 60 gigabytes of pure HTML, and it's not a problem at all to add features later on, so please don't limit your imagination. Imagine new features, imagine new analyses, send it to me. Not all everything that you send to me may be possible. I have a job as well, and I'm going to have lots to do at the start of the new year, but I, I really will try to, to do these. Be creative. All that's left to say for me is thanks for spending this hour with me. Here are my links. See you. Well, we can't release you so early because we have our Q&A, of course. First of all, thanks a lot. It was great to see how mathematics can be very exciting to analyze such data. And, well, as always, if you have questions, go to the microphones. And all those that probably leave quickly for the yearly review. No, actually, the, the speaker for that is still here in the audience. So it won't be starting that quickly, but wh whenever you are leaving, whatever you're leaving, um, so where are we with questions? Microphone three. Hi. A fantastic talk. Really great, I thought. What I'd be interested in, uh, did, did you want to see whether the whether they change articles depending on how many people click there. Well, 
If I understand correctly, they are testing. The, ah, do they do split tests and find who, how many people click on the article? I think they're doing that right now. Maybe someone from Spiegel Online will correct me, but I think they are trying it out right now. So what is split testing? Just for the audience, uh, they publish articles with different titles and see where on which the people click most, and that's the title that can survive. You change Spiegel Online by visiting it directly. Microphone one. Okay, uh, I wanted to ask uh, whether you archive Speaker Plus articles too, whether you include that. They have been available for a while. Do you have a Plus account? Well, uh, yeah, I am including them. And of course, I have a Plus account that um, automatically decrypts them. Um, decrypts them. Yeah, I was really annoyed when they started appearing because I couldn't decrypt them initially. And that's why you can find instructions on how to decrypt them on my blog. There's a positive thing about them. The Spiegel Plus articles are longer in the median, so um, you get something for your money as well. 1,001 words. 1,001 tales. <laughs> uh, did you look at contents in your analysis as well? Uh, word frequencies, perhaps uh, the link to categories or keywords through, uh, and link that with content uh, and to find whether keywords are complete or correct? No, I didn't. You can take keywords. I, I, that was quite quick and easy, but I didn't look at the relevance words relevant words within the article, those would, of course, be the nicer keywords, but I haven't done that yet. Okay, an internet question. Uh, IRC would like to know which software you used to collect the data, to analyze and visualize it, and whether the data is available anywhere. anywhere. Right, no, they're not available anywhere else, because partly because I'm not sure if I'm allowed to distribute them. I use the Pi data stack and the software for downloading, the, downloading it, I wrote myself, it runs on one of my servers. And beyond that, I use Pandas for my analysis, which is based on Python and then the whole PyData stack. Just Google it, you can find a lot on it. And for visualizing it, I use Tableau, which is a visualization software that has pre aggregated, no, that, that can use pre aggregated data up to a few gigabytes, and you can make nice graphs for it. And for the network plots, I used Gephi. Microphone 4. Did you analyze data real time or did you do that all in retrospect? I, whether you analyze the data while you collect them? No, I simply collect the raw data. And in the next step, I parse the raw features from it. And those are so few that I can actually keep them in RAM and I can create higher level, level features. So it happens in three, feet, uh, three steps. So I don't do it initially, but ever since I started giving my talk, I um, it's been downloaded another 10 times, so it, it does happen in parallel. One idea for the evaluation, you could look whether certain word groups uh, appear in older articles to see whether they've been copied and pasted together. You mean an anal analysis like per article you get 73% new content, yeah? Yeah, good point. I I'm going to do that. Hello. I just wanted to give uh, a hint, but I'll put it into a question. Could it be that the non-commentability of Israel articles is just a resource problem because maybe that be more to censor for legal on legal grounds? Uh, for yes. example, there might be singularities in German criminal law. Of course, there are that you can't say certain things, so that could be 
Yes, had it been only Israel, I would have thought that immediately, but no, yes, it could be, of course. This is a very important part of data science. I did that in a slightly sarcastic way, but of course, it's up to you to draw your own conclusions from the data. Yeah, that could be, of course. I mean, the only people who really know is the people from Spiegel, but Israel wasn't the only category that wasn't commentable, and there's no singularity about simply justice topics. Hello, David. Thanks a lot for your talk. Did you consider offering the software as open source so that other sources could be used, such as Tagesschau, the German TV news? No, I didn't. But to be honest, it's not all that difficult. You just write a script that um, runs every couple of minutes and downloads all the articles, and that saves it in a database. Done. The, the open source, the, the source code behind the, uh, behind this is really uninteresting. There are thousands of people who did it before, but yes, of course, you could do a compar comparison with other media. How did you remove the strain from your data? You broke it all down into two dimensions. The what? The the tension, because you have so many dimensions and you project it into two. So how did you make sure that things would be put above each other that are not really close to each other and uh, or the links aren't shown? In theory, you can never exclude that altogether, but I put a lot of care into the graph. I kept only the, the most important edges because otherwise you get far too many and then there are professional graph layout algorithms, for instance, the one that Jeffy uses. You saw it earlier. Of course, you, you have to invest a bit into filtering the, the edges. When you've done that, you're still not all the way there, but it's most of the way. You said that in October you visited Spiegel. What was their reaction to your analysis? It was positive. I'm not sure if this was simply because they can't do anything about it anyway. But I found the ex exchange very positive and very interested. And I liked going there. They're far, they <laughs> took it far better than colleagues at Xerox. Maybe a suggestive question again, but maybe this is leaning towards, well, opportunities for further research. Uh, the procedure, uh, the physics that we use to visualize topical closeness, would it be mathematically more correct if you had a singular partition of the adjacency matrix of these keywords and such such as PageRank has done. Yes, but if you do that, you can't make a, as nice a graph as I did, and you'd probably get a similar result. I mean, I, I see the values of the edges. Well, if you use all those dimensions, it's kind of equivalent. Yes. All is silent. <laughs> okay, three. Another short remark on the land on, on maps, uh, the, the methods, the, the springs. Ultimately, they position. How stable are those? I didn't dive very deeply into the theory. I'd be surprised if you could prove this, but they're established for large graphs because there's nothing to do there anyway. You just iterate until it looks right, and if it looks wrong, you just press start again. This is the practice. Hello. Did you uh, ever use Markov on your data to generate Spiegel data articles, I mean? No. Could you send me an email with that idea? Oh, we are going to have fun. I can just see it. <laughs> but we won't just do the. We won't just generate articles, but we'll also generate whether or not you're allowed to comment on the generated article. Oh, we could also generate author author names. Yeah. Right. I believe we've come to the end of our time. So, if you have further questions, 
surely you will be Actually, I'll be going out to the next beer bar that I can find. If that's not in front of Zal 2, it's in front of Zal 1, and I'll be there so people can find me. So, DDoS to the beer bar, on the beer bar. And it is time for that. Thank you. And thanks for listening to the translation. Your translators were Zebalis and, and Philip. And we love your feedback. Hashtag C3T, Twitter account, C3Lingo, email hello at c3lingo.org. We love to hear.